go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, this is the regular board meeting of the Montgomery ISD uh, Board of Trustees, July 21st, 2020, 6 o'clock p.m. If you will all please um, stand up and we're going to say the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God. The first item on the agenda tonight is the consent agenda. Um, the board has uh, minutes that we've been provided from the previous few meetings. And so I was wondering if anybody had any questions about that. No, sir. Do I have a motion? I move to recommend that the board approve the minutes as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Consent. Um, minutes approved. Um, at this point, we're going to go into comments from the board. Um, just a couple of things before we get into that. Uh, I'd ask that everybody keep their comments to five minutes uh, so that everybody has a chance to speak if they want to. Um, we cannot comment as a board back to you if you come and speak to the board. Um, not that we don't agree with you or approve with your what you're saying or we do agree or don't disagree. Um, we just can't comment back uh, due to Open Meetings Act laws. So the first person on the agenda, on the um, comments tonight will be Jim Porton. missed one. This is a new era, new superintendent, new ideas. What I have seen in the attendance, my attendance in these meetings has been the lack of accountability, I believe. This is my thoughts and nobody else's. I believe accountability is badly needed. And these are my observations. I think there's been a lack of leadership in the athletic program. I'd like to know who was responsible besides the two girls that caused $1.2 million damage. There's somebody else had to be involved. Who was responsible for the lack of leadership in the police department, in the hiring practices? When I was in the business, background and financial backgrounds, financial backgrounds were mandatory. It is my understanding that head coaches receive a great compensation package that is not tied to performance, but they're going to get it whether they're losers or winners or anything else. When I talked to Bo Reese or Dr. Reese in May of last year at the conference in San Antonio, I discussed the law of the inner circle. When you surround yourself with the best, you're going to get the best results as a superintendent. He hardly agreed. In fact, before he left, he hired Chris Lynn, a great addition, to help MIS MISD get on the right track money-wise. I believe he found a million-dollar discrepancy in OTC, OTE funds. So, great man. So I guess I'm charging the new superintendent and following the law of the inner circle. Let's make people accountable for the jobs they have been assigned. This is a new era for MISD. 
The board has done a great job of hiring Dr. Dixon as the interim, and I, for one, appreciate the efforts that the board has undertaken to obtain the right superintendent in Mr. Heath Morrison. I remember this little thing I said last time. Never ever be afraid to do what's right. Society punishments are small compared to the wounds we reflect on our soul when we look the other way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, I'd like to have Alia Esparza. <clears throat> Thank you for your time again. Um, I come to you as a parent of a special education student um, and a former teacher, and I have lots of concerns, um, and some may be addressed this evening later on with the reopening plan, um, specifically in what's gonna happen to those children that require services. Um, many districts around here have gone virtually for the first three weeks, and that means three weeks of no services for my child, which is unacceptable. Um, things like speech, dyslexia services, social skills, have to be done in person. They can't be done through a computer. Um, and what that does is it takes those children, and while they're already against the grain, it's gonna throw them even further back than they already are. And I don't want that to happen to my child. I know that there are many other parents in this district that also don't want that to happen to their children. And so I wanna know what the plan is going to be in regards to those children. And if there isn't a plan, there needs to be a plan, whether it's I bring my child up for his services because it's a small group or it's one-on-one, -on -one, or that person comes to my house if it's some, a child that requires PT or OT or things that a parent can't get their child physically there or unlike my child is not a healthy child and can't be in the school setting. So I wanna make sure that that is provided, but also at the same point, you know, in those regards to those children that you can't do speech therapy with a mask on because they're looking at your mouth, they're looking how you pronounce words, they're looking how you form words. So I wanna make sure that it's also brought to the board that some type of protective equipment, whether it's those things you see at nail salons, um, a face shield so that children are able to see their teachers forming words and not just children that require speech services, but any of your children in young grades Phonetics is a huge part of their education, and they have to be able to see their teacher's mouth. They have to be able to see those words. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the next comment to the board will be Ann Dixon, but before she gets up and says anything, uh, <laughs> I just wanted to say, um, this is Ann's uh, last meeting with the MISD um, superintendent, interim superintendent, and I just want to say a personal thank you for everything that you've done for us in the last couple of months. Um, I think we hired the right person for the right job um, at the right time. And, you know, a lot of times when you hire an interim superintendent, that person can sit back and kind of wait and and wait for the next person to come in. But you haven't done that. You've dug into the details, um, working with all of the administration, and I just think, just wanna thank you personally um, that I believe we're further along than we would have been had you not been here. Thank you. trumped me so um, I did put on that I wanted to thank the board and the community for inviting me into your area um, and I especially would like to thank this staff um, they don't like me because I don't let them take a break or eat lunch and they have to stay till <laughs> 7 at night <laughs> so no they did a fabulous job and I think if it wasn't their commitment and they knew you know where all the landmines were I don't think we could have gotten this budget 
turned around in a different pathway, and I think you're going to see a phenomenal plan tonight. Um, I think that we have been slow, but we've been slow and deliberate to think of all of our children, and there's a special part for them tonight, too. And so, again, thank you for letting me come to your community. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Okay, um, we don't have any other comments to the board tonight, so we're going to go ahead and go into the action items. Uh, the first action item is uh, considering approval of items for the Board of Trustees election, November 3rd, 2020. And you, um, who uh, who would be able to kind of give us a good rundown of what this? This is basically the election order and the joint election agreement, um, which would have been done months ago, but everything stopped after the filing, and so it's the same thing, basically with date changes to the November third. Um, there's no other surprises, I don't think, Chris. Is there anything in here? That was the only thing that I saw different was date changes. So um, it's the same order. Yeah, I think we actually had these agreements mm -hmm. for the May 2nd date and approved them. And then when it got canceled, so I, I'm agreeing with you. I think this is the exact same thing, just with the dates changed. Yeah, and I don't know, if Chris, if you can answer this or Dr. Dixon on on the cost. I know it's it depends on the entities. That's the entities within the county who are going to be holding elections. It, that's the max cost is the thirty thousand, right? If we were if we were the only ones. Okay. That was just what it was back in two thousand nineteen. Okay. You have to pay so much. Yeah, because this one, I don't I think if I recall in March or of last year, there was only a couple entities anyway, so there's going to be quite a few more. Um, one of the things that uh, you weren't here at that time, but one of the things that Adam had brought up before was uh, that on the election day, Lake Creek is one of the election sites. And so there was a concern about um, security on the campus. So one of the things that um, I think that we should at least think about is how we're going to separate all those people from the students. And you know, there were some. We changed the calendar. We did change the calendar. We changed the calendar. It's yeah, a student holiday. Day. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So if anybody didn't hear that, basically we changed the calendar. <laughs> So we fix that problem. We hope there's students in school. <laughs> okay. Um, with that, did the board have any questions about this agenda item? I move to approve the uh, joint election agreement with Montgomery County. Montgomery County Election Services Agreement order and notice for the November 3rd, 2020 election. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. On to our next agenda item, considering and accept excess collections for 2019 debt service and certification for debt service collection rate for 2021. That sounds like a Chris Lynn. <laughs> yes, sir. This is just an annual. Mm -hmm. I'll come back to it. Um, in fact, you have documents from the uh, tax assessor Did the board have any questions about that? So, Chris, when when the collection is 100 percent, I mean, is that a? I hate to even ask this. Is that a real number? Is that that's 100 percent of all property taxes were collected? Nothing needed to go to litigation. I, I don't know how she comes up with her number. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere, every year when I see this, it's 100%. So 
that's the assumed collection rate. Okay. 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 Any other questions from the board? Do I have a motion? Move to consider and accept excess collections for 2019 debt service and certification for debt service collection rate for 2021 budget year. All in favor? Second. Sorry. <laughs> Wait a second, guys. That's the. Uh, I'm on the. That's the next one. That's the next period. one. I'm, I'm one behind. Yeah. Um, authorize the superintendent <laughs> to submit the attestation plan once the attestation plan is finalized. Well, we didn't. He, we, he skipped that one. He went. No, he did skip that one. Yeah. I, was, I was right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're coming <laughs> back to that one. We're coming back to that one. Yeah. Don't worry. Yeah. Okay. Apologies. No, that's okay. So we need a second. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Okay. Action item C is approved. Um, so let's go ahead and go back to what I skipped, which was considering the authorizing the superintendent to submit the attestation plan once um, the attestation plan is finalized. Yes, the um, Commissioner of Education gives us three options for educational delivery. That's face-to-face, -face, synchronous, or asynchronous. Synchronous is two-way virtual learning, um, actual live. Uh, asynchronous is remote virtual learning where it can be intermittent, where we can post lessons. Um, we must have an attestation, which means that that's the method of delivery that we will offer. We probably will not use much of the synchronous. We could end up doing some of it in some of our virtual with some special needs and other small groups. We primarily are going to be doing the asynchronous. The asynchronous you must do, I kind of, uh, its analogy is it's going to be lesson plans that we have to do for the state. So um, because the deadlines for these, they're not prepared yet, but when they are, both of them, if you'll see the last sentence on both of the plans, it says that the board must approve the final plans or pre-approve the superintendent's submission. And I'm requesting pre-approval from you. I guess um, I'll, I'll ask the first question here. I'm just, I'm kind of confused about how these are used um, as far as if we approve or if we pre-approve them, what does this mean? It basically allows us to just submit our plans. That, and if you'll look, I attach the plans and we're literally going to check these boxes that will have an academic measurement, what um, grading policies we will be, what technology we will use. Basically, the state requires that we submit these. How are we going to track students' attendance and engagement? And it's, it's, it's kind of like a letter of assurance to the state because we're not providing instruction to the students face-to-face. -face. And so in order to get funding, we have to show them what are you going to be doing. So, so it really uses the word allow. It doesn't allow us to submit a plan. It forces us to submit we, a plan. If we use this method of delivery. The remedy for, is not something we'd be interested in. That is correct. Yeah. If we do not have the plan, then we cannot access the funding. OK. Which is important. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have any questions about this? <laughs> Just to make sure, this doesn't say that it's going to be online completely. It just says that if we're online, then this is the format we'll use. Correct. It's an option we have available. I noticed the instructional minutes was 240. I thought there was some conversation about 400. 420. Yeah. Right. 420 um, is 
well, originally that was that if we chose to do 100% online, they would have to be like in school with us for 420 minutes. Um, it's now been defined as 180 for elementary, 240 for secondary. Because we still need to let them have lunch. We still need to tell them go outside for a few minutes for PE, um, the things that we're not going to be able to provide. So, and the teachers still have to, we still have to give their conference period to them, allow them for planning. I think we're going to do a lot of recorded um, lessons that students can go in at their, their timing. Um, in a few minutes, you're, you're actually going to get a preview of the plan, and then we have to reduce it to paper uh, for submission to TEA. And then they're going to have readers that are going to approve them. OK. Any other questions? Do you have a motion? For yeah, I'll, I'll do the motion correctly this time. <laughs> Authorize the superintendent to submit the attestation plan once the attestation plan is finalized. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? OK. Uh, going on to the next agenda item, uh, which is considering the approval for budget amendment number one, uh, 2021 budget. So we had lots of talks this summer about the budget and uh, the board's desire to have a balanced budget. And so uh, tonight we are presenting to you uh, budget amendment number one, uh, which is a reduction um, in the budget that was approved on June the 30th. Um, that reduction is in the amount of $336,234. Uh, this is just the first uh, amendment of more to come uh, throughout this fiscal year. Um, so uh, by approving this amendment, um, like I said, you're reducing uh, the general fund budget by $836,234. So that gets the deficit right now at 1.1? Is that correct? Uh, right now, the deficit is uh, 800. Would be a little over 840,000. Very good job on that, guys. I um, appreciate all your hard works to get that done. Um, I know we're still working on that, but you know, from going from 2.8 million in the hole uh, down to 800,000. Um, it's been a great effort, so I appreciate that for everybody. Did, it, did the board have any other questions? Do I have a motion? No, I'll make a motion to approve the budget amendment number one as presented. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. <clears throat> Moving on to our next agenda item, consider the purchase of technology equipment for 2021 school year. Basically, we just gave you money in the last item, now we're taking it away. So um, that happens. Um, basically what this is, is we're required to provide the technology for the remote learning. And if you recall, last spring we gave out about 500 computers. Um, now that, and that wasn't required, the students. So we had to offer instruction, but this time, this is for real. This is school this time. And so we have to provide connectivity and computers for any student that does not have it. Basically, it's it's like their desk we have to provide. Um, the state is offering us an opportunity to, in a bulk purchase, um, to buy them through the state. Whether that comes to fruition or not, um, that they're going to fund 50% of it. Again, don't put that money in the bank yet. Um, but we do need to order them because we have to have these apparatus and devices available and we've got to find these hotspots for the kids to, who don't have access. Um, will it be a cost savings because we're not in school? Do we save this? Um, we spend about $85,000 a month on substitute teachers. 
So there's always savings. But again, as I told you during the budget process, this is how it's supposed to be done. Every month, anything that's going to exceed what was in the budget needs to come to the board. And so this is one of the first purchases that's going to exceed the $50,000 and will require a budget amendment. So, Does this get us closer to one-to-one? -one? Um, Ms. Busby? Uh, no, this will not get us to that point. But this will put us in a comfortable position to provide the needed devices for students that don't have them. Um, in the spring, we focused mainly on providing a device to families that didn't have any laptop, which, like she said, this is definitely going to be more real school. Um, so it may be that this will put us in a position where we can give a laptop per student in that family rather than having to have a family share one laptop. But it does not get us anywhere near a one-to-one -one situation. And I know you all probably go into it a little deeper in the presentation portion, but when, <clears throat> with a number like a half million dollars, how did y'all generate that, that number? Of the, I mean, the amount of kids, how, how do we know who needs what? Right. So this was a, um, uh, again, a, something that was put out by TEA that they would be funding part of this or would be trying to fund part of this through the CARES Fund. And they put out a survey and they said, we need your numbers by Sunday. <laughs> and so when we did that, um, we went back and looked at the survey that we had used in, sp in the spring. And we kind of used that as a baseline and an estimate. So this, these numbers really are based on an estimate of what we saw as a need um, in the springtime. And we know that we passed out uh, right around, like she said, 500, maybe 560 laptops in the spring. So we knew we would need more this time if we were providing it per student. So it's based on estimates from that. Did they give us any idea on the cost per laptop? I know uh, some yes. of this involves the equipment yeah. as well. So, uh, um, when they did the bulk order, they actually had it laid out. They went and got bids on different devices, and they said, here are five devices you can choose from. And we had to select it. And they had the prices there and everything so we could choose from. And it was a great deal on the device that um, we, we couldn't have gotten that deal on our own. Um, and then as far as the hotspots, same thing. They listed different providers and, and options that we could choose from. And again, we had looked into that already. Super deal being able to go through this process. Thank you for that. I got a quick question on by setting this money up and buying all these equipment that you said required does it by default mean that we're going to keep the kids out of the schools longer because now we're getting more we're facilitating the the stay at home I and mean, we, we may do in the spring but by default it seems like we're saying we're going to be closed longer when the only thing I hear is we want to go back to school from everybody right um I know what you're saying but um, because of our health order, we have to go remote, and we can't exclude any student from that. If this really only did happen for three weeks, we still have to provide a device or an area for them to come to the school to use a device at our campus. So it doesn't really supplant, um, and I think this also makes these available there's a real possibility we could do the remote the first three weeks, come back to school, go back out, come back to school. We don't know what that trend is going to be. And if it, I would not want to appear to be indifferent to those students who don't have this available to them because then we would need to bring them to school. And that might not be an option of the, that desired by their parent. Are we going to need to hire more personnel to service these laptops? I can't answer that, Ms. Busby. Hopefully, no. <laughs> I'd say that. Um, right now, I think we're in a good position um, to be able to service because it's just, you know, it's a, it sounds like a lot, a thousand. Um, it'll be a lot of setup originally to get them set up and out. Um, but after that, we have some campus techs that I think will be able to help us manage that. Um, Maybe a need down the line as we continue to increase our inventory. Um, but right now, no. And I will say, I know we were talking about remote learning here, but the benefit also of this is when we are not even having to talk about remote learning ever again, we just scored a great deal on 8,000 laptops. I was going to say the uh, little school district I grew up in in East Texas uh, got some type of grant for every school to have a laptop. They in turn had to hire two full-time people. We're talking about a small school. 
because they were breaking daily. And now we're not even at school. So there's some considerations behind the scenes, I think, that'll be well above the 500. I'm sorry, ask that again. I was saying that there'll be considerations well above the half a million dollars for service and maintenance on the backside, potentially. Yeah. Again, I, I don't anticipate right now any additional costs needed for that. Any other questions from the board? Dr. Busby, I'm interested in the hot spots. Mm -hmm. Where are they going to be? Or is that coming up later? The What's hot the spots? Part of the question? Where are they going to be? Okay, so um, this is a uh, service through Verizon. So they're individual hotspots that would be checked out then to the family. Okay. Um, so it's a mobile hotspot right. that would go to their home. Awesome. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Do I have a motion? I'll move to approve the purchase of the technology equipment for the 2021-2021 school year. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. Uh, that's it for the action items. Um, so I think we're going to go into uh, the star of the show here, which is the, um, the school reopening plan. Am I on? We've had plan A, B, C, X, Y, Z, whatever. We've had every plan in the world, and we've heard a little criticism that we've been a little slower, but I want to believe that's because we're more deliberate and want to get it right the first time. Um, we did receive yesterday a health advisement from the Montgomery County Health Division in which we cannot bring the children back face to face until September 8th. And so with that, that reversed our plan. We were going to bring the children back face to face with a remote option. For the first three weeks now, we'll be bringing them back. Teachers are going to come back on the 5th, and then the students will start on the 13th. So we're looking at a maintenance calendar of what we already have currently. At one point, we were going to, and you heard a lot of this from our surrounding districts, we were not going to, we were going to move the start date back to the 19th. That was to get into the first announcement. Remember, we had to come to school five days a week, offer every student face-to-face -face instruction. Within days of that, it was replaced by um, you have a three-week phase-in with remote if you wanted to. Then we had a four-week phase-in. Now we have a mandatory three. So anything I say tonight may change tomorrow. <laughs> and But the team has been so flexible. I, I think that's been the frustration by our parents. And we have shared that. We have made more plans than probably the garbage can can hold right now. Um, the health order did say that staff could come back. So, and the purpose of staff coming back, not only to be in an environment that's, that's instructionally compatible, but also so that they can start practicing sanitation, social distancing, and preparation for the students to come back. Um, the staff will, when they return, this program will not look like it did in the spring. This is going to be school. And the students are going to be graded. They're going to, we're going to take attendance. And one of the ways that they're counted in attendance is there must be a progress measurement. So they're going to have to turn in homework or be on face-to-face -face on a Zoom meeting with a teacher, do a presentation. Something is going to have to evidence that they were in school and participated successfully. Um, the parents then... We are going to be tomorrow, there is going to be an online survey in which they're going to 
tell us what we call the technology needs, and you're going to hear a little more about that from Ms. Busby. But um, they're also going to tell us when they do come back on the 8th, how would they like their children to resume their education? Face-to-face -face if we're able to offer it, um, or would they like to stay online? As it becomes closer, the health order is going to reassess on August 24th, and if they allow us to reopen, then the schools then will go back and visit that survey form, what parents said they wanted their children to come back, do they still want them to come back, or do they want them to stay out? Because there's going to be circumstances that are going to drive their decisions. So we're going to give them a, a, a first round decision that won't be binding, and then a second round decision a week or two before they come back. Um, the purpose of our parents coming back, I mean our teachers coming back to practice and, revi and refine the health protocols for us to them to get very comfortable back in the classroom, to arrange the setting that's accommodating for social distancing, to learn our practices for sanitizing. Um, we are going to allow for the three weeks for our uh, staff to bring their children to school so that they will be there and we will support that with teacher aides and people like that to supervise them in their areas while they're online doing their school. Um, I would like at this time, Mr. Morris, could you address the health protocols? While Mr. Morris comes up here, in our plan there are several sections, health protocols, instructional protocols, technology, meals, and other. So we'd like to start showing our plan at this time. Good evening. As we look forward to August the 5th, and I'm going to stop, try to stay calmer tonight than I did last <laughs> time I talked to you guys. As we look forward to October the 5th, October, August the 5th, and the excitement of bringing our teachers and staff back to, back to campuses, uh, we have been studying the TEA guidelines to help us develop uh, or enhance our, our uh, health protocols. And so up here on the slide, we have uh, eight bullet points that uh, emphasize parts of our plan. Of course, the plan goes into a lot more depth than this, but these are the high points of what we're going to do to keep staff safe. All staff will be required to self-screen for COVID-19 daily. This self-screening includes taking their own temperature. Each staff member will complete the district screening form and sign in daily. So before they come to work, they should self-screen. And this should include them taking their own temperature daily for symptoms for COVID-19. If a case arises, then we will follow the TEA guidelines for either re-entry or if it's a close contact case for the incubation period. We'll follow the TEA guidelines there. Mask or face coverings will be required for all staff members. Personal protective equipment will be provided. We will be providing masks. We will be providing uh, both throwaway masks and usable masks. We will be providing shields as part of the protective equipment along with other um, things like we'll get uh, thermometers, we'll get uh, gloves, those types of things. Social distancing practices will be put in place when possible throughout our buildings. All meetings will be limited to essential meetings only and when possible, those meetings will be held via electronic means. When electronic means are not possible, meetings should be held in areas that social distancing can happen. Hand sanitizing stations have been placed throughout each campus. As you walk in this campus here, uh, you see hand sanitizer uh, stations and throughout all of our campus, we have multiple uh, hand sanitized stations. Hand sanitizers and disinfectants will be provided for every classroom on every campus. And campuses will be wiped down and disinfected daily. Those are just high points, eight bullets of what's in our plan 
and we will do everything possible to keep both our, our staff safe when they return and ultimately when our students return the same. Thank you. Um, I would like Ms. Graves to, and Mr. McFadden and Ms. Berg, could you join them? Um, I, you didn't do this, so I don't need to ask you to, but um, if you have questions, would you wait till the end because I think your questions might be answered. And I would also, y'all come on up. I would like to show you the mama. <laughs> Um, we are going to be providing face shields for our staff, so if they don't feel comfortable with the mask, also so our children, uh, it is encouraged in third grade and below for reading and those types of things that they'll be able to see their face anyway. So we will be providing these. We're good? We're good. Go for it. All right. Wow. What a spring and what a summer we have had. Uh, lots of sleep, uh, sl sleep has been lost. Obviously. <laughs> uh, I don't know what I'm saying. Uh, when we left in the spring, the big, the big fear was, when do we bring these guys back? You know, if you leave, when do you get to bring them back? And so it's kind of been in the back of our mind. What, what, what we did in the spring was what we had to do, a Band-Aid. Well, we had to prepare for the real event that we could be coming to a remote experience in the uh, fall. And so we've been planning for in-person instruction and we've been planning for remote instruction. And so both Wendy and I have been working with the principals and teachers to try to come up with a system that because of what Dr. Dixon said, we could come back, we could go home, we could come back, we could go home, and we're thinking, what a nightmare for a master schedule and for different things. And so we tried to come up with a system that could work for in-class instruction and remote for part of the kids or for 100% of the kids. And then if we come back, it's the same system. So I think we've come up with a good plan that will allow us to switch. Monday, we're in class. Tuesday, some, a Monday afternoon, something happens and we're out of school on Tuesday, we can switch to remote like that because kids are going to have uh, a certain continuity to the instruction, whether they're at home or whether they're in person. And so this first slide is just really some things that, that uh, both programs, an elementary program and a secondary program, will have. And, um, and I'm just going to go through the bullets. The first is, uh, and we're only going to be talking about remote because that's what we're doing for the next three weeks uh, with our people. We're going to have a website that goes live after tonight that's going to explain all of it. This is just the highlights of the program. There's going to be a website that's going to talk about the traditional program and the remote program. But we're only discussing the remote program tonight. Um, and it will take place through September 4th, which is what the current health department order is for. So MISD remote learning will be, a, will be much more structured than in the spring. And we, we listen to a lot of parent feedback about our spring experience, and we've tried to a, adjust for some of the things that were uh, difficult in that experience. Uh, teachers will be teaching remotely from their MISD classroom. That is a big thing. This is going to be, if we're going to give a schedule to every kid and we're going to expect them to follow their schedule, we're going to have teachers in classrooms, and so kids are going to have to go on at certain times and interact with their teachers. So we're expecting them to have an asynchronous experience with some synchronous qualities built in, some live interaction built in. So all students will be given a schedule, and it's going to be the same as their in-class schedule, so that if we have to flip between the two, they can easily flip, and they'll have the same teachers in both experiences. Students are encouraged to complete assignments during the normal full instructional times, and we've listed the elementary instructional times and the secondary instructional times as the same times we've always had. Students should anticipate a minimum of four hours of instruction and or classwork daily. Uh, grades will be given according to the same guidelines as traditional in-person learning. They'll be getting numerical grades just like they get when they're in class. Uh, for the remote experience as well. Students are permitted to participate in UIL and extracurricular activities and are subject to the, to the standard eligibility rules. We 
We went a lot of different ways on this before we finally made the decision that this is the best thing for kids. Uh, we're going to allow them to participate in UIL activities, and I think a lot, most of the districts around us are doing the exact same thing. Uh, even if they're in the total remote experience like all of our kids are going to be for the next three weeks. Uh, students are subject to take all state and district assessments for accountability and progress monitoring purposes, and that's a state uh, rule there. And then we're going to talk about this a little later in our uh, meeting, but we, we listened to parent feedback, and one of the major things was there's too many passwords and too many programs, and I can't find which password goes with which program. And so we, we've purchased a software called ClassLink, which will be utilized to eliminate the need for students to manage multiple logins. And so they'll log in once, and all of the resources will be in, in what's called a backpack, I believe. And so they'll be able to then go into Google Classroom or Seesaw or any of those programs and they'll log in automatically from the class link login, which should help uh, in accessing the district programs from one location. Okay, the next slide's elementary okay. specific. So while we feel like we did a pretty good job last year, we invested a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into remote learning. We realized that it would be much better. And we've learned so much from the spring and listened to our parents and our teachers on ways to improve that and organize what we're doing so that our method of presentation is clear and is consistent and the students are successful. So the elementary uh, department has decided to go with a um, learning management system called Seesaw. Um, it obviously sounds a little elementary, but um, it is a platform uh, that we can post assignments, we can post videos, we can chats, all kinds of things, uh, and it's very user friendly, which was very important to us because we heard our parents say, I, I don't know how to work through this platform that you're using. Um, it will provide a lot of consistency for the students and the parents. We will provide training for our students and our parents um, through some videos that we're going to start sending out pretty soon, um, and we will do some extensive training with our teachers. That was one piece that we did not really get to work through in uh, the spring because we didn't have our teachers to train them. They were sent home and then we spent our spring break figuring out, okay, what do, how are we going to get this remote piece going? We're now, we didn't get our teachers back August 5th. We can create a plan and train them so that they are very versatile in Seesaw and they can really work with the parents um, on using the platform. Uh, the lessons will come in a variety of ways. We will have recorded lessons. Probably in your younger grades, like K2, you might see some small reading groups um, live uh, because how are you going to teach kids to read? We need those small reading groups. Um, once we um, have the lessons or the small groups, we provide an assignment to check for understanding for what has been taught. Uh, teachers will provide daily feedback and uh, monitor the learning and the progress. This is going to be done daily. And whatever the student or the assignment the student is presenting to us, we are going to provide feedback and they're probably going to get a grade on that because we are going to follow uh, the MISD upgrading guidelines. Engagement is our number one priority. Uh, we're at a disadvantage because we don't know our students. We're going to start the year online and try to, try to get to know them online. So at the elementary level, we're really planning lots of opportunities for engagement uh, with our parents, with our students, so that they can get to know their teacher and maybe some of their classmates um, through some uh, Zoom meetings, phone calls, and visual videos through Seesaw methods like that. Um, we will follow the MISD curriculum, which is aligned directly with the TEAPS. So we're going to be teaching what we would normally teach when we return to school. We're not going to change up the curriculum at all. We're going to continue um, after our curriculum. We will take attendance on a daily basis, and students are required to follow the 90% attendance uh, rule. So that means that if they don't log in that day, we can't make contact with them that day, then they are counted absent that day. So we're going to really invest the time to make sure that we are contacting them um, that they're logging into the platform, that they're working on some assignments, that they conference with a teacher, or they can watch the video, some sort of participation every single day. In the spring, we did it through the week. 
you have this week to uh, finish all the lessons that you have assigned on this day. The whole week's worth of lessons are due. And we've decided that that is not best. And so we're going to be looking for daily lessons, daily participation. Any questions about elementary? That is a very good <coughs> overview. We're going to have um, some things that we're going to pose that's going to give a little bit more detail. And of course, the principals are really going to start pushing out some detail to um, our teachers and our parents. Any more questions about elementary? We're saving questions. Okay. You want, <laughs> you want to save questions? Is that what you said? He would like to save questions to <laughs> Secondary. Uh, when we were thinking about secondary, one of the major things we heard in the spring was you have eight periods a day. I have to log in to eight different classes and eight different websites and eight different, it was a lot. And if you had three kids, it was 24 things you had to do every night or every day. And so we thought a lot about that. And uh, the first bullet on here is, I'm gonna explain a little bit to you because it's gonna be really good for remote instruction as well. Secondary students, we're gonna move to, at both the junior high and the high school, we're gonna move to an AB block schedule class schedule where they attend four classes instead of eight classes. Instead of eight 45 minute classes, they're gonna have four 90 minute classes and they're gonna meet every other day. And so remote instruction, you'll have to have four classes to check in with every day and uh, vice versa. But in when they come back to school for in class instruction, we'll also keep it on a block schedule. Uh, and that will help us in keeping students progressing forward in each of their classes. If it's a block class like we have at the junior high, like for math and language arts, they'll meet every day for the allotted amount of time, 90 minutes every day, because they meet for 90 minutes now every day. And so it's just spreading the periods out, one through four on A day, five through eight on B day, and then you just repeat it every sequence. And so three times a week, you'll go to one class, and two times a week, and then you'll repeat that on the next week. Uh, so it's a good schedule. A lot of our high school was on it for years. Uh, that way, teachers will only have one conference period every other day, which is a negative, but it's for 90 minutes instead of 45 every day. So the same amount of time in the schedule. We're actually gaining instructional minutes by going this way because we have less transitions. Uh, and for the safety and students, uh, safety of our students and staff, when we come back to in person, we were asked to look at that transitions. So we'll have half as many transitions as we would on an eight period day. We're able to have more lunch periods this way. So when kids come back, we'll be able to social distance better at our lunch times by going to a block schedule as well. Less transition, less movement in the building, more instructional time. So it's a win-win for the things that we look for in secondary. Uh, the second bullet, teachers will hold engagement sessions with their classes to progress monitor instruction. They're gonna do that with Zoom and Google Meets, and these will be synchronous. And we're, we've got a scheduled time for that so that it happens at least once a day with every student, and every core subject will meet every week with their students once throughout the week. But they also, that's a minimum. Teachers, will, we anticipate teachers will do more uh, than once a week because they're gonna see uh, the need for it, quite honestly. But we wanted to set a schedule up because we want to check on not just the instructional objectives of the kid, we want to check on the social and emotional connections with that kid because we don't know them right now. They're new to this teacher and we might have a teacher that has 150 kids. And so they're gonna to have to spend some time initially synchronous learning who their kids are because education is a, is a relationship experience. It doesn't happen outside the relationship very well. And so teachers are, are well aware of that and a lot of these first lessons are gonna be built on forming that relationship with a kid. Uh, luckily, it's much easier for them. They form their relationships on that phone much easier than us old guys do. We like the face-to-face, -face, but they're, they're much better with it than we are. But that's uh, the engagement sessions will happen weekly, or daily and weekly. The district has addressed the concern of multiple platforms. We're gonna to go to Google Classroom and ClassLink at the high school level to start with. And then from there, we'll be able to branch out through ClassLink as we get further along in the year. 
Uh, students will be expected to participate and check in daily for attendance. So attendance will be checked every class through some method, whether they're turning something in or they're logging into the Google Classroom or ClassLink, we'll be able to track that or when they're in the face-to-face -face sessions. Uh, students will be subject to the 90% requirement for attendance per course uh, at the high school level for sure. You have to be in your courses 90% of the time in order to get uh, credit for the course. And then this last bullet's interesting. Uh, certain electives that require hands-on activities may require students to attend on-campus activities in order to fulfill the requirements of the class. Welding, culinary art, robotics, uh, health science, a lot of the things uh, have to have you in class and so we're, we're allowed to bring up small groups even during total remote experiences to fulfill some of the career and technology education courses, course requirements. And so we're working with principals right now to figure out what's the best way to do that. Ag, if you're, if you're raising an animal, it doesn't do the animal very good if you don't come for 30 days. Uh, you're going to have to come up and <laughs> check on your animal more than 30 days. So. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna account for some of that. So students may, if students decide later on they wanna go total remote and they don't wanna come to school at all for whatever reason, uh, health concerns or otherwise, we are gonna allow them to requ request a schedule change out of those electives, because most of these classes are electives and not core classes. Uh, and then they can remain in remote if they ch so choose to do that. But that's just a brief overview of the elementary and secondary. And then, Ms. Berg. Okay, so, Mr. Hello, so first off, my mask is made of lemons because we're gonna make lemonade out of all of this. We're gonna stay positive <laughs> and we're gonna do what's best for kids no matter what. So, um, our students within special ed have access to all of the things you just heard. Um, whether they receive special ed services or not, they're general ed students. So that comes first. Ours just had a, have an added layer of needed support, depending on what their IEP team has determined um, and their evaluation says. So um, to kind of piggyback on allowing certain groups of students to access different things at school at times during virtual um, we do plan on scheduling some of those things. I'm not going bullet by bullet, but just to speak to the plan, we are going to schedule with our parents um, individually uh, based on need for speech services, dyslexia services, um, their 504 accommodations, making sure that those are in place, and then of course those special education students that are accessing an alternate curriculum. Um, so it's, it's, it's a completely different curriculum than what their general ed peers are accessing. Um, they would need to access parts of that on campus uh, due to the need for occupational therapy, physical therapy, the socialization that comes along with part of their IEPs, um, their individual plan that they have. Our orientation and mobility has been very tricky um, to get our students to be able to move and maneuver and, and keep those muscles progressing in the right direction. So um, our campuses will continue to work with families individually based on the individual student needs. Um, that's what makes special ed to me so special because you, you really can't have a blanket plan. Everything is individual. So it's based on each individual, individual child's needs um, and what their team deems most necessary for them to access what we're trying to do virtually and hopes that we can get back in person very soon. Um, I, I touched base on 504, but those accommodations will remain in place for our students that have 504 services. Um, some of those fall into that dyslexia um, services um, pot of kiddos. And so we're going to make sure that the speech services are scheduled individually as well as dyslexia. We're looking into more of the options with dyslexia. Um, so more to come on that. Stay tuned. Uh, but we want to make sure that you know it's part of the plan. We're going to schedule based on student needs. As you can see, instructionally, we will be addressing all of our students. Remember, we said some students are going to be coming to school during this three weeks. Um, our bus drivers will be on duty. We'll be providing transportation and all of those services. Those will be arranged with the parents individually in small groups. Um, Ms. Busby, could you come speak to technology? So I'm going to sit over here and show some things as we're going through. Um, as we kind of talked about remote learning, the students are going to need access to high-speed internet and a device. Um, 
So the technology survey that is going to be sent out is very important. Um, we'll be using uh, all of our communication avenues to send out the information of where the link is and how to get to the survey and to fill it out. But um, we ask everybody to help us to share that information too. When you get that, make sure your friend got it too <laughs> so that we do get the information on all of the students um, so that we can make plans uh, for the technology needs that we have. Um, the questions that will be answered on that survey will help us know which families um, have access, can get access, and then it will identify the ones who need that assistance from us. And then we can reach out to them after that and help solve that uh, issue with them. Uh, the other thing that we talked about, and it was an agenda item earlier, is that we are ordering additional laptops and internet hotspots. Um, we do feel like we um, uh, will be able, if we go this first three weeks, we can pull from classroom laptops and uh, campus laptop carts to be able to get enough out to start. We may not have those hot spots from the state by the first day of school, um, but that doesn't mean we're not going to give a solution to our parents. We will be reaching out to them and make sure that they do have um, some type of access and, and get a solution to them. Uh, the other thing we talked about already is class link. We will be um, implementing uh, that solution. Uh, it is an information item after this plan is as well because I really want to tell you a lot about the bells and whistles and what all we're getting with it. Um, but it, one of our main things is, of course, uh, eliminating the need for all the multiple usernames and passwords. And if you had to have your password reset, these two ladies right here <laughs> were in the background, so we are very, very excited to have this class link uh, program to implement too. So we felt your pain um, when you were going through all of that. So um, this uh, is going to help all of us um, uh, as we go to the remote learning piece. It was something that was needed even um, before the remote learning. Uh, as they mentioned again, Seesaw and Google Classroom will be our two main platforms that we'll be uh, posting assignments and things like that in. Um, during the spring, if you um, participated in it, we did do Wednesday webinars with our parents to help support learning in that, uh, learning of the different platforms. We do plan to implement some training opportunities for our parents um, as well as our teachers because it's just as important um, to you as it is to the teachers to be able to know how to use these programs and navigate that. So you will be watching for that. Um, and we'll have that available. We will make them recordings as well so that you can access them at, at any time. Uh, so that will be coming. And then the uh, next thing on here is we will be reviewing the website that is going to have all the details that you want to know. So on our MISD webpage uh, tomorrow morning, you will see a link uh, right there on the left-hand side. That menu, we will post the link right there. It'll say Montgomery Moving Forward. And that is where you're going to get all the details. So this is what we've been working hours and hours and hours on in plan A, B, C, D, X, Y, Z, as she mentioned. Um, and, and this is what we currently have in place. And I will mention this red sentence here, just, uh, just an FYI. This plan and contents are definitely subject to change based on any kind of health orders that come down, TEA guidance that says we have to change something. If they say we have to change something, then we have to come back to the plan and we have to change something. Um, and we'll also uh, continue to take input and revise it to make it the best plan um, going forward. So this uh, site, again, it, as you scroll through here, you'll see the different options. We have our traditional in-person. So if you want to know what it's going to look like when we come back on September 8th, Click right here, and this will take you to all the details. And I will preview that page in just one second. And then also, here's the remote, remote learning. They uh, hit the highlights on all of that, but this is where you can go, click on that, and review um, the information that was shared tonight. Underneath that is our COVID health response. Um, Mr. Morris hit the highlights of this, but this has details. So I do recommend that you go here and check out the details, look through um, everything that we got from TEA guidance. We've, we've put it here and how that's gonna look in Montgomery ISD. Um, some great charts um, that are there that also help kind of understand the flow in, in the different processes. Uh, this is 
the location of the survey. Uh, again, we're going we're gonna to send the survey out in multiple ways, but you can always come to this website and the survey will be here. And this is where we will uh, determine your technology access. The links are also over here on the left, so you can navigate between the pages um, here as well. Let me go ahead and just click on traditional in-person so you can kind of get an idea of how in-depth the information is there for you. Each one of these drop-downs is a category, and I don't know how well you can see it from where you're sitting um, out in the audience, but it covers instructional setting, uh, arrival, dismissal, transition processes, what we're doing for meal service, transportation, um, other operating procedures, our guidelines on use of face masks, uh, extracurricular and non-academic activities, and visitors and volunteers. So each one of these um, is a drop down, so you can click on it and it has additional information uh, for you to see um, just all the thought processes that have gone through on each of those pieces. So that is our traditional, and again, the remote learning the same thing, we have broken down that information and posted it here. So anything that we share tonight, you'll be able to go back and review. And then our COVID health response page. I know that chart looks small, but you can click on it. It'll make it a, a larger PDF so you can review that. Um, this is our public health planning guide, guidance, um, but it is based on the TEA guidelines that were put out. And so then all the other details about uh, student health protocols, employee health protocols, and also for visitors. So again, all of this um, will be posted. Uh, the website is uh, pretty much ready to go. It will be live in the morning. Um, as soon as our technology website person gets here in the morning, she will have that link live and ready to go. Uh, so you'll be able to view the, all the details tomorrow. I know that you're thinking a lot of what if. Um, I think that once you start digging in to the background information, you'll get your answers to what if you have a lab positive student in a class, what if you have a lab po positive staff person, you will see the flow chart of exactly uh, what we do and how we do it. Miss Lopez is like, her brain is crammed with all of these guidelines right now because there is no guideline that's for everybody. Every single person's circumstances will present differently and so they will come meet with her and her staff to determine are they COVID leave eligible, uh, sick leave, when does it start, how long will you be paid. So each one of those people will have their own return to work plan. Um, the same with students will, the first thing that will happen is we have to notify the health department. The second is the student who may be um, lab positive or symptom demonstrating, then we will notify the parents of whom the student has had what they call contact. And that's where we're gonna really encourage the face masks because if a student is positive but everybody has had a face mask on, then we don't have to do some of the requirements. The other thing is 15 minutes of continuous distance from the child. We'll determine all of that and notify the parents that are appropriate. But in addition to that, every parent in the school and all the staff will get a notice if there has been a, a positive identification. So communication we think is important for people and parents to make decisions. And so we'll be treating staff individually and we'll be notifying everybody as far as parents and notifications. Um, food is always important. Um, our food service will continue during this three weeks. We will have uh, five distribution points for one hour in the mornings. Um, We'll have a lot of people bringing lunch to school because remember our teachers are going to be bringing their kids too. So, and as we talk about how the rules change every minute, um, 
Mr. Hurd came running in at three and said they've changed again for UIL. So we changed that. Um, they have now pushed forward by five weeks the entire season. So I know that y'all are calculating that. Yes, the playoffs will be after Christmas, the first time in our history. So um, we're, we're still, we have done a really good job with our strength training and coming back early. So we've got our kids already in the, the practice of all of the, the skills. The difference is being they're not going to be able to come back to practice on August 3rd. That goes to September 7th. So just think in your mind, everything is pushed forward, band everything along with that we have to take into consideration when are we going to allow our students to participate and how and so we will not be sending our band to away games mainly because the buses right now we're probably going to have one student to a seat and that'd be half of our fleet going with our band to a game so but um the, if they all agree, the teams that we're playing, then we will for, they will forfeit their time at our games so that our band will have twice the amount of time when they're at home if, if we work on this. Again, we're looking, we thought we were going to have to look for games because, um, you know, Houston said no sports until October 19th. Now that we're all pushed up to them almost, we might be able to recover some of those games. Um, the technology survey, do not forget, July 22nd, everybody get on there, tell us what, you ne what your needs are so we can get started on that. Also at the very, very end, we want a little bit of a preview of your choice of face-to-face or virtual if you come back in on September 8th which would be your choice if we have a choice and you'll probably be contacted by your campus um, transportation needs are also that's going to be one of our just no solution we just not real sure how we're going to do that um, we were encouraged by an original survey we did in the early summer and a lot of our parents about 50 percent said that if they had to bring their child to school they would and so we would encourage some carpooling and some grouping um, during the summer while we bring our small groups back our special needs kids for their individualized services our buses are going to continue that transportation will be provided a parent might opt not for that because they may not want the child to be on the bus for 30 minutes to come in for 30 minutes of speech, um, but it will be provided. Um, we'll be also collecting those transportation needs when we do the first survey and the second, or just the first? The, on the second. So that gives us a two-week window to route all these kids, so it's gonna be important. But I think we have a good plan in. I would like to introduce my partner in crime, Dr. Morrison. He attended all of these work sessions while we did this, had great input, and he's my memory gap too. He keeps saying, no, it's not that date, it's this date, so. <laughs> she kept on wanting to say we're going back on October the 2nd, so, uh, but she got it right tonight, that's great. <laughs> Look, I, I have said all the time, uh, leaders, we don't get to choose the challenges we face. We just get to face how we, how we face those challenges. And coming in with this team, these administrators, principals, thinking about how we're going to face these evolving conditions has been a, a really learning experience, but it shows the caliber of people and how much they care about the school district. There are some guiding principles that we have held ourselves to. The first is always the safety of our staff and students is foremost, and that is the most important priority. There are no compromises with that. The second is we have to demonstrate that we ourselves are learners. And so listening to our teachers say, we need some training if we're going to do remote learning better than we did in the spring. 
that's being provided. We heard our parents say multiple platforms does not work for us in terms of trying to deliver remote instruction. So we're listening and we're learning ourselves. The third area is we have to practice to be very, very nimble and very agile. Uh, I shared with the team once I went through a leadership training with a, a general who said battle plans don't survive first contact with the enemy. This plan will change. As a matter of fact, I asked Amy to put on flashing lights, subject to change. We will get guidance from the governor, from the commissioner of education, from TEA, from the health department, and every time we get guidance that we have to follow, uh, we will change the plan and we will communicate, communicate, communicate. But we also hold ourselves to make sure that we are always doing what is in the best interest of every single student. We have a bias to want to have your children back in school as quickly as possible. We have to show that when we are able to bring your children back to school, we will do it safely. So we will take these three weeks, we will embrace remote learning, we will show we will do it better, but then we hope that when it is the opportunity for our parents to choose to come back for face-to-face -face traditional instruction, that that's a great option for them. So uh, thanks to Dr. Dixon for inviting me to be part of this. And uh, we sure there are many, many questions that you will have. Do you have any questions? I'm, the staff is ready. <laughs> we couldn't ask anything that we have not discussed, <laughs> I can promise you. We've discussed and cussed and done everything else, too. So. <laughs> well, you actually did just cover what I wanted to ask at the end of as soon as possible. Because I have heard no one say that they want to do online learning, period, across <clears> the board, all ages, everything to include students, they want to go back to school. So you just, like I said, preempted that with, as soon as we can go back without question, we're going to go back in school if a parent so chooses. We, we actually, up until yeah. last Friday, okay. that was the plan. Plan A and, was well, yeah. the choice. Right. Plan B was remote. And, and I was on Google board with plan A, and then the email today, I was like, wait a second, what happened to choice? Exactly. Yeah. And what happened is the health advisement. And all of the Montgomery schools are doing the same. Um, we had, several of us had some different plans, different start dates, and decided to change calendars and things like that. That really, we were actually on a Zoom with the Montgomery County superintendents on Friday to discuss this as soon as we hit, you know, Monday morning, you know, refining this. We had already had a plan B, which was this. Our plan A was face-to-face -face choice. And we were actually going to send that, that was the survey that was going out tomorrow, was going to be how are you going to send your child back or are you going to stay at home? So we were already there. If we'd have had our board meeting last week, you would have heard something different. And then the health department advisement, the TEA has actually extended it to some options, uh, four weeks without board approval. If we stay on distance learning past, board, past four weeks, I must come back for board approval. Uh, we can't do that unilaterally as a staff. If we stay longer than four weeks without any other interventions, um, close, shut down our health department, we must come back without y'all giving us authorization to stay closed. Let me ask a question. Um, and, and I've got a handful, like you said, there's a handful of questions, and I, I'm just going to start with one. The, <laughs> The, uh, the fact of the matter is these kids and parents, the relationship there is they drop their kids off at the front door, they get on the bus every morning, and they go to school. And then they come home, they either get picked up after school at the front door or they get off the bus. The parents don't have to do anything. You know, they, I mean, for the most part, you know what I'm saying? It's the, it's the kid's deal. Are we going, let's say there's a couple parents and they both work. They've got three kids, seven-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a 16-year-old. They've never been in a learning environment where they learn at home, really. I mean, not six hours a day, five days a week kind of thing. Our, my question is, are we going to educate or give the parents or guardians of these kids what is a setting or a 
separation or a togetherness or whatever that is conducive to learning in an unmanaged home environment. I mean, I think th these teachers do a wonderful job of, of, of managing the kids all day long, but th it looks to me like they're gonna be self-managed. I'm just thinking also like the little, if there's, if, if there's three kids at home, two of the kids are going to do the right thing and the and the knucklehead brother is going to go try to find a way to you know subvert the system in any way that he can and then go tell his buddies you know here's how i got a grade and i didn't even sign in that day you know i'm, I'm not saying it's right or wrong i'm just saying we're kind of assuming everybody's going to do the right thing are we going to have systems in place you know, for doing the for kids that want to do the wrong thing the synchronous learning is the two way where you're sitting there engaged and I actually asked that question so if a kid gets up from the kitchen table did he just run out of school you know uh, how how do we know that we've talked a lot about their environment and that's the one component that virtual learning doesn't give us control over the environment that they're in the difference this time though is going to be engagement and you're right somebody's going to beat the system these kids are so smart with technology they're going to be able to do things we can't even imagine but elementary or secondary do you have i, I know we're going to have webinars for parents just in instruction but um, how to turn their house into school I don't know. A couple of things really quick, though. I think, first of all, it's really important uh, that in the presentation, the class links, which you'll get a sense of, that will make it easier for parents to get into the platforms and then the reduced platforms. I, I know many parents, when they had that situation that you spoke about, they were in one platform from elementary school, another platform for middle school, another platform for high school. So reducing the number of platforms will also be important. We have talked about training videos uh, that we will put out for parents both in how to access class links and then other ways to have, make the technology uh, more conducive for their learning environment. So there's lots of different things. I know uh, at the high school and the secondary schools with the uh, conversion to uh, four, four day block scheduling, that's gonna also reduce some of that. Uh, it will not be perfect, um, but we have to strive to make it excellent. Amy, do we have any way that a teacher could monitor how long a student was logged into her class? With the implementation of ClassLink, um, as long as they go to ClassLink to log in, like that's what we're going to be training them to do, that program will track the amount of time that they were um, at least logged in. That doesn't necessarily mean engagement, um, but at least logged into those programs. And can a parent go back into that? And at, when they get home at 5:30 or 6, can they go in to see if the student? How, how could I, a parent yeah. um, check to see if their student went to school that day in the kitchen? Right, so I don't think there's gonna be the opportunity in, in class link on the parent side to be able to see that. Um, as we do more trainings on Seesaw and Google Classroom, there are some pieces involved in that that have a parent component where they can be able to see the um, student's environment, especially Seesaw, there's a, a whole parent piece where they can log in and actually see um, their portfolio. Um, in Google Classroom, it's more of a daily report that um, the student has not turned in X, Y, and Z, or they have completed these um, documents. So there's at least some part of a monitoring piece that's in included in those. The teacher will monitor that as well. None of us are looking forward to this. It's, you know, we're looking forward to the challenge of trying to do what we did that's been put in front of us to do, but we realize it's gonna, there's gonna be a learning curve, but we're gonna track kids too, because we, we realize they're gonna get lost if we're not communicating with parents and saying, hey, we haven't seen your child today uh, in our system, you know? But as far as the environment, the learning environment at home is hard for us to control, you know? And it's gonna show that they're logged in, but it's not gonna necessarily show that they were logged in and active at that time. Uh, we're gonna have to rely on teacher. the feedback they're providing the teacher, uh, whether it's during live interaction or whether it's assignments being turned in and the quality of the work that's being turned in. 
And then if we're not seeing them, we're going to communicate with parents, uh, hopefully very soon when we're not seeing them. But uh, it, there's a lot of unknowns. Uh, this, is un, this is unprecedented, really, that uh, we've been starting a year <coughs> totally virtual with, with kids. You know, secondary teachers have a lot of kids to manage, uh, and they do it a phenomenal job in our traditional settings. I mean, I, I think it's shown the value of public ed and, and the jobs that teachers do, because now we're seeing when they're not coming to us, it's a handful, uh, and so we're going to give as much feedback as we can. We're going to try to locate every kid that's supposed to be in our classrooms. Are we are we going to have the the calls? You know, your student uh, did not log in today. Yes, kind of thing. The, the truancy laws are still intact, and we'll file on students who do not attend school if they have not logged in. Uh, there's an attendance period. The 90% rule is you must attend a class 90% of the time to get credit for the class or be promoted. Now at elementary, that's a grade level, but 90% of the time for a high school student is 90% of that class. We only take attendance one time a day, but we'll be taking attendance in every one of those classes for credit purposes every period. For funding an attendance person, it'll be literally, like we said, as if the child were at school. We're going to take attendance every day at 10, 9.42 or something. I think I, our PEMS person, there is a, there is a legal time that, every day that you take attendance. Obviously, I understand the, the cards that we've been dealt, but I think it's tremendously I don't want to use that word, I guess. I, I think it's unfair, has a potential to be unfair for students to be graded on a normal grading scale when they're sitting at home, you know, at their kitchen table. Uh, it's one thing to learn vocabulary. It's another thing to learn algebra from your own home. And so what is going to be the protocol when a student is struggling? Um, you know, I was just looking it up here. I remember from college, you know, grading on a curve, right? Which uh, kind of helped some come up. But, you know, last year or years before, teachers would be able to offer tutoring, you know, at, at the school in their off periods and students that were struggling to master a subject could come and, and be tutored. Um, I would assume that's off the table in this well, particular situation. No. no, it's not. We can bring small groups in. And we, and we do have... plan to, if the student is struggling, we do plan to set up a time where it's just the student and the teacher maybe through Zoom to work through some of those things. Our interventionists will still work with our students that are struggling. They'll still be working with them on a daily basis just like they would if they were in school. I'm just concerned that is three weeks of remote learning if we're going back September 8th, is that enough to isolate how far someone is behind, right? Does that make sense? Did I ask? Probably, probably, probably not. Probably not, right? And so the maybe rating. maybe they don't even, maybe it doesn't come on the radar and then we get to school. And Correct. I, 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 I say this knowing that we're dealt the way we are, but I do think it's tremendously unfair and, and to a lot of students. And the grading component is a requirement of TEA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if we would have actually, if we had designed the, the imaginary, I gave the principals a homework assignment and said, next week when we re-meet, I want you to give me your imaginary school, your perfect you know, school with, with all these guidelines. And I handed them out the synchronous requirements, the asynchronous, the face-to-face, -face, all the, di I mean, we did model classrooms. The principals came up in, in this building here with uh, Mr. Morris. We took a standard desk and tried to figure out how many different configurations we could have of an elementary classroom. And the maximum that we could get was 17. We know we have a 22 to 1. So, um, you know, those challenges, our hope is that we just do the best we can do in this very short period of time, knowing that it could be extended. So have what we have in place be not just what they referred to as a Band-Aid like last year. What was referred to me as a parent in an email, my child, all he did was coloring 
for <laughs> March and April. That's not going to be. It has to have the rigor. We're going to lose kids. Not only did uh, we can do um, Zoom with individual students, y'all, we can bring small groups of kids to the school. We can still do that. If we identify a student that is just can't even engage, we are going to address those needs, student by student. In, just in reference, thing that's a, along with that line, um, you know, every year when you have students that are in poverty, you have to face the summer slide. And students that are in poverty tend to lose half of what they learned the year before because they took an extended summer break. There is a very real COVID slide that every school district across the country and TEA has put a lot of research out because all students, whether they're impacted by poverty or not, have been out for such an extended period of time, there has been lost learning. There are TEAK standards that they may not have been exposed to. So we've engaged our principals. We already have a formative assessment suite ready. We're going to try to figure out where students are, where they need to be, individualize that learning to make sure that we're catching them up. And to Dr. Dixon's point, you know, as we're looking at these three weeks, the guidance that came from the health department is that we can bring small groups of students in. Uh, special populations and so that's something we've challenged our principals is how do we try to perhaps get an early start on those students who are struggling who are behind and get them in this period to get caught up. So you mentioned the COVID slide and so would it be safe to assume that perhaps in the three weeks of uh, you know online learning that that three weeks may be geared towards evaluating the impact of that COVID slide on our MISD students, or is it going to be new material that's going to be uh, rolled out during that three weeks? One thing that we've done with the curriculum with our coaches in the curriculum department is we've identified the teeth that are the most critical for what we missed in the spring and what we're going to start with in the fall. And we're actually going to create documents that our teachers can use to show them exactly which TEKS are very important as they're related to other TEKS in their learning later on um, so that they can focus on those and actually do a little bit of reteaching at times to see how well um, they mastered those in the spring, how prepared will they be to learn the new material. So we are thinking about that and we're um, trying to create um, some documents that will really help guide our teachers when they're planning their lessons to keep those things in mind. In, in reference to the small groups, you brought it up, bringing kids back, and Dwayne, you spoke to it earlier too, talking about the hands-on type classes, the AGs, the the um, the uh, trade school, the the special services. Now they've given us the ability to do that. They told us we couldn't when we had to go back, but did they give us a number per campus per? group per size how we'd social distance within those campuses in those special groups or is it un i mean I, I know it's obviously not unlimited but <clears throat> they, they didn't give us a number it's by individual identified needs now we do have some guidelines um they've reduced they haven't even stuck us with the six feet apart they have said when able or if you can so if we had to have 18 desks in a room the mask you know they've given us all the guidelines but no they have not identified the kids or put restrictions on that one of the things that i wonder about and you may not have the answer to this question yet but one of the things I, I worry about is we get past this initial three-week period and then some, some parents decide that uh, they're going to keep their kids home for a while. They choose that remote option, but then they get into September and October and they're like, no way am I going to keep doing this? Um, and so now we go to, they bring, start bringing their kids up to regular school. Um, or, you know, we have an incident you know, we notify the district, and now some parents aren't comfortable sending their students to in-person learning. So I just wonder how we're going to... Um, we do have guidelines for that. Um, the first thing is, is that that's one of the reasons, and I think we're one of the few people that are going to do the two-step parent choice, that in their survey tomorrow, they're going to tell us if, you know, when we come back, on September 8th do you want it to be face to face and then the two weeks before that we're going to give them the opportunity 
and if they've pulled out all their hair and broken everything in the house, then they're going to want their kids to come back. Um, but the, the legal guideline is the parent can only make a choice to flip the instruction at a grading period. So that means for every elementary, a parent can only change at the six weeks and at the secondary nine weeks. Now, that's not a restriction for us. If uh, a child is COVID positive face to face, we can, by the switch, put him into virtual. Um, if we have to uh, do some social distancing and some isolation <coughs> of a, a COVID positive kid was in direct contact, meets all the, the definition, and we have to socially isolate uh, four or five kids, and we can flip them into virtual. They don't even have to miss a day of school. Um, so it's one way for the parent choice, but two ways for us. And if we see a student behind, I think there'll be a tremendous amount of encouragement from the teachers and the school and the interventionists and the instructional coaches. Please let us have him back here. You know, we'll keep him in as safe an as environment as possible. Um, the American Pediatric Association has definitely talked to the issue that this is the lowest risk of all the populations and one pediatrician the other morning on the thing said we send our kids to play football where they can have concussions and heat strokes which are much higher rate than COVID exposure you know for a child so I think it's gonna have to develop into a trust thing that if they send the, the child to school do they feel comfortable? I have a question for when we go back to school. I noticed that a lot of the parents were concerned about if they transported their own children, the car rider lines. I'm sure y'all have talked we about have that. We have talked about car lines. <laughs> okay. We talked about car lines. I know. I'm sure this maybe staggered times I, or something. I, some mother told me one day, and here she going to call Uber. <laughs> I can't go about Uber. And, uh, but um, we have talked about that. And okay. that's going to be, you know, we're talking about different routings, driving on grass, go behind, go around. Other doors being open. Stagger. Yeah. Yeah. And we are going to multiple entries. Yep. Yeah that instead of just coming in one door, have grade levels be dropped off at different areas. Um, the little bitty ones where the parents like to get out of the car and walk them up, we'll have them delivered to the playground instead. No, we've talked about oh, those car Good. lines to do. Super. For one thing too, we have to make sure, we're playing whack-a-mole, right? So yeah. the reason most schools had fewer entrance and exits is for school safety. Sure. Now, because of COVID, we're having to have more <laughs> entrances. And the safety issues that cause us to have less access and entrance didn't go away. So we're just going to have to think about it differently. We're just going to have to bring new thinking to this sure. and, and have those conversations. Each campus will have a different plan because each campus is configured differently. And we will give all the support that is entirely possible. And sure. you know, the interesting part is there will be some employees who will have a slightly different job because their regular job is not going to be necessarily needed at certain points. So we will uh, reassign them to things like, for example, helping with entrance and exits uh, on a campus. So we're planning that uh, with all of our schools, but trying to specify it to the unique configuration of each campus. And then there's a whole other thing around cafeteria, which will also be challenging, sure. but we will rise to that challenge as well. For any, this might be for Dr. Lopez, for any staff that maybe are pregnant or face maybe a higher risk, or do we have contingency plans for them if they need to step away? What are they? So, yes, as Dr. Dixon men mentioned earlier, we'll look at each one case by case. It's very hard to uh, just blanket out each yeah. one of those because even the one you just mentioned, say uh, a, a pregnant uh, employee, 
it would depend what that doctor said. So we will all go back to what the physician's documentation is before we try to make any type of uh, determination. So one-on-one -on -one consultations for every person. Okay. And then, um, Mr. Hurd, earlier today, UIL had some statements about practice times and things of that nature. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, what, what were they? I only have three more questions and I'll shut up. Um, so after September 8th, um, maybe review for me again, what does instruction look like for a teacher after September 8th? Are they going to be doing it at the same time? Are they going to have to do it after hours for their online kiddos? How does that look? Uh, we'll probably actually uh, assign classes. I uh, Jump in and tell me. They'll already well, I can, have. I can say secondary wise, we, we spent a lot of time on this and we spent a lot of time building remote classes and building in, in class and I think what we decided on is we're going to require this three week period is going to do one thing for us. It's going to get everyone started on using uh, Google Classroom as a way to turn assignments in and out and so we're going to continue that process so that if I may have 20 kids that are in person in front of me and I may have five that are uh, remote. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna not I'm not gonna do anything different in my instruction in class. I'm gonna teach my in class students, and I may record that lesson uh, with my document camera or whatever, load that in, and then still load the assignments in Google Classroom for the remote students. And we're still gonna have our day our, our daily check in uh, for social emotional for instructional support and those type of things. But we're not gonna we're not gonna move kids into one section and then move them back out. That was a nightmare when we tried to work the logistics of that because some have special services that they need or a co teacher and then moving them into a remote that didn't have the co teacher following them or the services following them. And so it this turned out to be the best case and then they have the same teacher whether they're vir uh, virtual or in person. So if they flip for uh, necessary because they were in contact with someone or they choose to go uh, remote or they choose to come back in person, that teacher is a constant for them. <coughs> so it's, it's, the, it's the most ideal that we can come up with. Yeah. Um, and then my second to last question is related to the teacher's kids. Would you review that again for me, Dr. Dixon or Dr. Morrison? Could I let Miss Graves, there's actually some rules about that, that the teachers are going to be allowed to bring their, he asked about the Yes, system. Um, so we're going to approach this from a very organized, um, with a very organized plan. We are going to allow um, our teachers to bring their kids to school. Um, we worked with advisement for surrounding districts to ensure that we were all kind of thinking the same way um, and understanding that it's very short notice for our for our parents to find additional care in you know a couple weeks when they're thinking they're going back to school um, so we are going to um, have this teachers register that they would like to bring their child back to school we have set guidelines for them on what the expectations are for the child to be there um, because the number one priority for the mom 
is work because she's she's working and so um, we are gonna set a schedule so that there is time that the mom and the teacher the teacher can be working in her classroom without her child there um, so that she can focus on what she needs to focus on and then there will be times during the day um, that her her child will join her in her classroom does that, and that answer your survey question? is going out to our teachers yes tomorrow. we will send out tomorrow a letter and a survey to our teachers asking them um, what their plans are so that we can kind of get in our mind an idea of how many how many we're talking about um, so that we plan appropriately my last question is what can the town y'all have done a lot of work what can the town do to help you I mean what can we do to help y'all Grace. Grace? Patience. Grace and patience? Grace and grace. A little, yes, gra little bit of grace. <laughs> uh, one of the things that we did talk about um, is if we're not able to get these hot spots here timely, there might be a neighbor that might let them come to their home or their backyard or of course you all know last year the kids congregated in the parking lots um, our high school kids needed a little socialization while learning so and they could log in um, uh, things like that um, I, I think also to be alert we have something in the state of Texas called Child Find. If you do believe that there is a child that is not getting educational services, um, we're not asking you to tattle or anything like that. We need to know because it might be something that we're doing that's impeding it. And we need to get them connected. That's not a pun, <laughs> but we need to we need to get them to school. If either by one of these small group offerings, face to face, or uh, some kind of a device, or it might be parental support, um, things like that. So that would be the main thing. If you know a child out there that is not engaged with us, please let the school know. I mean, and you'll know that. If you see a kid outside playing all day long, you've probably <laughs> got an idea he's not on his computer. And let us know. We, we really would like that. Then I would say um, there has been an enormous amount of work on this plan, and there will continue to be an enormous amount of work on this plan. We will change it based off of guidance from TEA, government officials, health departments, but we will also change it based on feedback from you. And so as you go through it, and it goes live tomorrow morning, um, please look through it. And if there's pieces that you find are missing, if there's things that you don't think are clear enough, just let us know. And we will work to evolve the plan and make it better and better. We cannot over-communicate. Uh, and the other thing is just patience. Uh, we will not be perfect. We will strive to be excellent on behalf of your children. And, and your situation it, even if it's just one, is important to us. We might not notice we schedule PT for 8.30 and OT at 1.30 and something else, and we didn't realize, oh my gosh, we got this kid shuffling. So, um, you know, let us know if it's not working. Let us know. You, you had mentioned earlier, I just want to say something real quick, not a question. You mentioned earlier about uh, being criticized for not getting our plan out sooner. We know a lot of this is out of our control. I was one of those ones that brought that up last week, just you know, to get the message out. But in, in delaying that and putting it putting it back and making sure that y'all did it the right way, I just want to commend y'all on the job you did by putting it back. I know a lot of this is out of the control. It's certainly not ideal. But thank you, thank Dr. Morrison. We got a two for one the past couple of weeks, and then um, and then thank the team. Just a phenomenal job to put all this out there for us. I know it's short notice, and I know it's going to change again, but it's it's much appreciated. And and because of that, if you get calls of concerns, please pass them on to us. Um, you know, I, we we will not meet somebody's needs or preferences maybe I should say and we're willing to work on that so if you get contacts don't hesitate to call us send send us an email send secondary to Mr. McFadden or elementary or if it's food service get it to Bobby or somebody and we'll get on it because if there's one person that's got a problem we probably have two so 
Any other questions from the board? Good job, guys. Thank you. I think the last thing that we had on the um, information items was the, the class link presentation. Yes, I know you've heard a lot of information. I'm going to get the highlights. <laughs> um, but there are several things no that class link is going to do for us that I thought was worth sharing. Um, so we've already talked about it's going to um, eliminate all the need for remembering all those different usernames and passwords. So a student will log in and every other program we use will eventually be in this um, in class link. They'll log into class link and that's how they'll get to everything. Uh, we're going to roll it out in phases. So in the beginning of the year it's important that the kids can log into class link and they can use that then to get to Seesaw and they can use that to get to Google Classroom. Um, that's the beginning. And then after that, um, we have other great programs out there um, that why we want to streamline what we use, we can't say we're not going to use anything else because we have a doc adopted curriculum that's available online. So we're, we definitely want to tap into those resources like STEM scopes and Benchmark Universe and things like that. So we will eventually add that layer into ClassLink as well. The great thing is, student still just logs into class link and it almost looks like apps on your phone they click on the app for that program that they want and it takes them right into the program so it's really going to help as we build the tools the students are using for them to make it easy for them to access um, uh, we'll get to the point as you may have heard i think it was mr mcfadden said something about a backpack so the students will have a backpack in there that matches their schedule so if Mrs. Smith is using certain programs, she can put those into her backpack and then it makes it easy for the student to go and see that teacher is using this program. Ms. Jones can customize her class so that the student goes to that backpack and knows exactly what Ms. Smith and Ms. Jones is, is using in that day. So it's really going to help as an organizational tool, whether they're remote or whether they're in class, um, that's going to be a real benefit to um, our students and our teachers. The other thing that this program does is um, it is helping with our um, uh, creating our student accounts and our usernames and logins. So it's actually replacing, so there, there is a cost to ClassLink, but it's also replacing one of the, another third party program that we're using. So it'll offset that cost some as we replace that program to create those student accounts. Uh, the other piece that we had a request from our um, staff was that we have on our computers at work um, an M drive and an N drive. So a network drive where they, they store a lot of their documents. And when they went full remote in the spring, they couldn't access those because you had to be in the Montgomery ISD network to get to them. Uh, ClassLink is going to be a tool for us to um, add access so that no matter where they're at, they can still access those network files. Um, so that's another solution that it's giving for our teachers that I think they're going to be pleased to hear um, that they can get to that uh, anywhere, anytime. Um, so that would, if we wanted to implement that again, um, that would have been an additional cost to us had we not had the class link. So that's going to be another benefit to us. So lots of great things coming for there uh, through class link. Again, it's, it's going to be rolled out in stages um, before we get to all the bells and whistles, but it's going to be a great tool for all of us. Is this an annual fee? Yes, it is. Any other questions from the board? Well, that's all that we have. Um, we do have some monthly accounts re receivables and uh, accounts payables reports out there, financials. Did you guys have any questions about that? OK. Um, so at this point, we're going to go into closed session. It's authorized by the Texas Open Meetings Act um, and talk about the things we have in our agenda there. I'll back, show you. I'll show you. Coming back from closed session now, and this is again the uh, board meeting. So, uh, with that, do I have any motions from the board? <laughs> yes. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the personnel as uh, presented. Do I have a second. second? All in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, any opposed? Okay, motion passes. And the second. Motion. 
move to approve moving forward with the hiring of Dr. Heath Morrison as superintendent of schools for Montgomery ISD and contract as agreed upon in closed session. Do I have a second? I'll okay. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. All right. Was that? Oh, that was a that was a yay. I thought there was a whoa. <laughs> Go shooting, go shooting in the head.